The views on a breath of fresh air podcast reflects the parties involved, and we encourage you all to use it as a conversational tool that will lead to personal studies of your own. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Welcome to a breath of fresh air podcast. Here with your hosts, Earl Roberts and Nakaz Gay. As a young person, Christianity can be so foggy, like smoke in the mirrors and so unclear. But we're here to bring you a breath of fresh air. Today we're exploring Nehemiah's chapters 11 and 12, where the story of Jerusalem's restoration continues. Join us as we uncover the sacrifices made by its residents and the vibrant celebrations marking the completion of the city walls. Get ready for an exciting journey through Nehemiah's narrative as we delve into the heart of Jerusalem's revival. Let us discover courage, dedication, and joy that define these chapters. As always, be blessed and enjoy. All right, welcome back to another episode of A Breath of Fresh Air podcast here with your hosts. Cause Gay. And Earl Roberts. Hopefully everyone out there is having a great week. Oh, had a great week. And be able to enjoy and rest on the weekend, man. It's always good. It's always good. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing pretty good. You know, leg getting better. Every day at the time of this recording, it's only been a day. Since our last recording, so I can't give you an accurate update. You know what I'm saying? But uh, my family and I are about to travel to celebrate my mother's B day. We have not taken a trip in a while, so okay. Extravaganza. Yeah, yeah man. You got when this comes out, you'll be coming. You already be back from the vacation. It's wild. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that is true. Last episode is when, yeah, we could be on vacation. All right, cool. So yeah, I mean, we back. You know what I'm saying? Like it was Hopefully good. It went well. <laughs> yeah, it went well. You know, everybody feels refreshed. We tied off. Oh, we need a vacation for our vacation. You know what I mean? You know that type of way. But um, oh, I know the feeling. Oh yeah, that's that's usually how I am though. Like that day, I gotta I gotta sleep that whole day. But wait, when I get back, like I gotta just rest, relax, and then the next day. I feel like a champ, but overall, you know, I'm thankful to God for, you know, moments I can share with my farmer. It's been a while since, I don't think we travel together. Like, yeah, I don't think we travel together since before college. Like we've met up in a place, you know, mm-hmm. usually um, by my sister. But yeah, we, we haven't, haven't got the opportunity to just because our life and schedule and stuff. But, you know, by the grace of God, I believe it, 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 it was fun, you know. <laughs> I believe it was fun. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure we'll hear about it in a future episode. It's wild. Yep. Um, yeah, man. So with you. oh, I mean, doing well. Doing well. Um, all right, like you like you say, it's like it's been a day. So <laughs> <laughs> when we do these back to back to back ones, it's always interesting because it's always like, oh, mm-hmm. I don't even know what to say. But you know, through it all, God's God's still good. Um, like this morning I ran about like three and a half miles. Whoa. Um, ran, walked. Like it took about like 45 minutes trying to get my cardio up. But like uh-huh. while I was on, like while I was doing that, like in my mind, it was just being like praising God, right? Um, I don't know if you don't get to this chapter or if you'll get to it in uh, the future episode, right? But essentially just talking about like how the Israelites were praising how they um was able to like finish the wall, right? And it, and, it, and it just had me reflecting on like how good God has been in our lives. Um, and just being grateful, grateful for that fact, you know, because like on the day to day, you know, you feel like the stress of life, you feel the the burden, you know. But like when you look back, you're like, man, it might have been quote unquote hard, right? But God was still faithful. God still kept His promises, and you know, God still showed up and showed out, you know. So, man, just being not to the praise, you know. I was listening to Total Praise this morning too. Like, I will praise you, you know what I'm saying, in the next song. Then when you came out, I was into like a marching band, played a song by Praise by Elevation Worship, which is pretty, pretty, pretty jiggy if you ask me. 
But <laughs> yeah, man, like just being just being out to the praise, like praising God for what he has done and praising God for what he's about to do. And I mean, sometimes we get caught up in our current circumstances because things might not, might not always look too bright. But we serve a God who is a way maker, man. We serve a God who can turn, you know, so, so, nothing into something, you know, mm. because, you know, faith comes by, faith comes by hearing, but faith, you know, faith is also the substance of things not seen. And it's like, I was reading, reading the book about faith. And he, he phrased like, faith is the substance of things not sensed because, you know, people feel like faith, like something should be tangible, but God's like, you know, I can... You believe in me, I can make a way out of no way. And, and that's that's just the attitude that we should always have as Christians. We, we, we're we believers. So, yeah, man, not to belabor the point, but I, I feel like it's just a great attitude to have. And it's, it's just a great reminder that we should all have, man, because God's a miracle worker. Amen. We got our faith that he's still in that miracle working business, man. We read the Bible and it's not just about, you know, we haven't harped on this point in a while, but it's not just a fairy tale book. It's a book about real things that happen. Like God was literally leading these people, guiding them by a pillar of, fire and a pillar and a pillar of cloud like god was really raining mana down from heaven god was really winning these battles for him for them these people who last chapter last episode who who were recorded who signed this covenant were gone these were real people these were real memes these people literally signed this document this has been recorded for all time these are real things that actually happened and i mean especially in this age the devil has a lot of people believing that you know the bible is a myth the bible is a fairy tale book um, the Bible is outdated. These things didn't really happen. It's a lot of uh, poetry and symbolism. But I mean, I'm here to tell you, like, you could argue with me, you could have your opinion, but I'm telling you, like, the Bible is real as an actual book. So, yeah, I mean, bro, <laughs> it's, it's, and it's, it's so many schools of thought that land on that. But it's just so interesting because, like, some people could hit you with stuff and it, it sounds compelling. It might actually shake your faith. Like, bro, that's crazy. <laughs> But when you get, when you get to the meat and potatoes of why, of how this was established, you realize it's all a theory that the Bible is fantasy. They don't have, they can't prove to you that, oh, this, this is, you know, this allegory or this is um copied from something else. They can't prove that to you. Like, like just for instance, <clears throat> some people believe that, um, even people of Jewish faith, some people believe that the um the most of the most of the Torah and stuff was written during the time of Hezekiah, right? So like so Moses didn't write these books, right? And some of these stories are just combinations of stories and traditions and folklore that was passed down together and, and it's just put together, but even academic scholars would say, bro, like when the Jew, when the Jewish faith, when they when they put together the Bible, when they wrote the Bible, fantasy novels and stuff was not a thing. Like, like people didn't write stuff, fake stuff for entertainment. You see what I'm saying? Like they might have fully believed that this was true, but it's just passed on to them. But it's not, it's it's not, they didn't really have a base for it. And people believe that. You know what I'm saying? People mm -hmm. believe that. But then you realize they don't have evidence to prove that. They just believe that because when they look at when they look at the flood story, the Bible has a flood story, and then you have people like the um, the the Mesopotamian, the ancient Mesopotamian world. They have a flood story, you know what I'm saying? Oh, the way the way Deuteronomy is set up, it's it sounds just like how Babylonian, the Hammurabi, and all these things like it sounds just like that. You know what I'm saying? And they use all of these things and they say, bro, this had to be a plagiarism of mm -hmm. that. <clears throat> you understand what I'm saying? And I'm like, okay, but do we live in a world where somebody could have learned to write an essay in MLA format, which is the same format that you all write that essay in. That's why we have this preface. That's why we have this, that, and the third. And it follows the same theme, but the content of it is different. So what's interesting to me is that people would say, oh, all these ancient Babylonian, this steely, that, that, whatever. The Bible just copies all of it, right? And I'm like, okay, so show me in, in the Babylonian stuff where it says um, a Messiah is coming or where it says that um, he, don't have no other gods before me. Show me where it says not to worship idols. Show me where it says um, to keep the Sabbath. Show me, show me these things in it. You cannot. 
because these are things that are unique to to the to Yahweh to the Most High God. Mm. But you know what? You could show me. You could show me where it say if somebody gouge out your eye, you gouge out their eye, right? You could show me where it say if somebody stealing from you, have this penalty. You could show me where it say if somebody kills, have that. Bro, it does not take. It does not take divine intervention for someone to say, bro, do not kill somebody. I think, I think outside of being a Christian, we could agree that killing is, is wrong. Now, some people, some people have a different moral compass. You understand? Some people kill and they don't have no conscience or whatever. But in general, no matter who you are in the world, bro, if someone you love is killed, you are, you are, you are angry about that. You are sad about that. You don't want that to happen. You see what I'm saying? So it's like... You have, you have similarities in ancient texts. Yes. And I will admit, some of these ancient texts predate the oldest manuscripts of the Bible. Facts. They, sometimes they predate it by a thousand years based on how, however archaeologists date these things, right? But to me, older does not mean correct and older does not mean original because we cannot prove that this Babylonian thing was the first thing that's ever written, but we can't prove that when, when um, um, the Greeks, um, when um, Alexander the Great came and conquered the world, that they didn't destroy a bunch of stuff. Because we know for a fact the Romans destroy plenty of stuff when it comes. All these people, they destroy, they destroy, they burn down. You see what I'm saying? The um, the Egyptian Library, library. Of Alexandria got you burned see, down. You see what I'm saying? So I'm like, bro, how much history was lost, right? So you could find something that's four thousand years ago, right, from Babylon, but then you see something from from Hebrew culture that's 3,000 years and it has similarities and you say, oh, the Babylon, the Babylon is the original, it's right, and the, the Hebrew is the replica of it. That's interesting to me. If we, if we follow the biblical narrative, we know that Shem, I mean, that um, Noah had three sons. If Noah served the Most High God, right, and his three sons were actual witnesses of the flood, and only one of them turned out to be dedicated to God. The other two was doing whatever they want to do. But they witnessed that this was a first-hand account of the flood. You don't think they could pass that on to their generations? So you don't think other cultures would have a, a, rep, a representation of the flood? And I'll be honest with you. Um, I was telling the story to, to, my, to my sister. Mm -hmm. I remember my, my father would tell me about my, my uncle Sidney, right? My uncle Sidney, he was a butler for the royal family. You see what I'm saying? And if you watch the show Crown, he's Sydney, he's actually in the show, like as their butler. You're like, and um, I knew I had an uncle Sydney that was of a lot of importance. This when I say uncle, this is my father's uncle, it's my grand uncle, right? My mm -hmm. grandmother's brother. And for some reason, most of my life I thought that was Sydney Poitier, who they was talking about. You understand what I'm saying? Because, you know, in the Bahamas, like, you might run into someone who you never see before, never can see again, and your mommy might be like, oh, that's your cousin. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? That's your relative or whatever. That's how I look at it. I was like, I never see this mom before. I see a picture of him with the queen. Uh, he must be some important person, whatever. Like, it's a, a picture we had in our photo book. Bro, when I got to college, the way that story remixed in my mind was that Sidney Poitier is a relative of mine. So... All, all, and, and people are going to laugh at me, but it's not true. I'm not related to that guy no, whatsoever, that I, to my knowledge. All, so your all, mommy just laughing here in this right now. Yeah, no, and I don't think I have, have even shared that to my mommy. Because, it, but it, anyway, I can get, I can finish it. So, <laughs> during Black History Month, they celebrate Sydney Poitier. Mm -hmm. And I felt, I took it personally, because I like, bro, this, this, this is cousin. Did I say it now? Uh, in, in another way, I could have taken like, oh, this the Bahamas anyway. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But I'm like, no, this farm. This farm, bro, for real. Like, you know, you feel me? And um, so it wasn't until I started trying to find out, but I have, I know we, I know I have family in France. I was trying to wonder where the connection is, like how who y'all is for real, right? So I mm -hmm. asked my mommy. And she was like, Yeah, yeah. So you have this uncle named Sydney. He was a butler for this person, the Duchess or whatever. Then they move here, then they end up in France or whatever, right? So I, so now I like, all right. It's a few Sydneys in the family. So I asked my father one day, I was like, just, just to get, just to, just to get clarity on this. I said, nah, there's a lot of Sydneys in the world. And by any chance, are we related to Poitier? Because I started to get suspicious. And he was like, not that I know of. And I look and I say, wow, everything I know is a lie. But I could not blame anyone but myself because I conjured this up in my own mind. So stick with me here. 
So when they have the flood story, right? Your, your ancestor or your relative may have told you the flood story. You might not have been paying attention. You, you, your memory might not be the sharpest, but you do your best to reiterate the way you remember it. That's why when you hear other versions of the flood story, they have like this superhero conqueror. Hey, we coming to save the world from the flood X, Y, Z, but it does not line up. But one thing we could all agree in, 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 in the, in the ancient world, there was some big flood. You was just telling me in, um, in Mexico, yeah, in Mexico, they, 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 they spoke about a great flood, you know, these different parts of the world, bro. <laughs> ancient Mexicans, the Aztecs, they talk about it. You know what I'm saying? Then we have people in, in the Middle East, in the Near East, they, they, they hold on to this. It's true. But to me, to say that, oh, one person is plagiarizing someone else. I, I, to me, I, it's, just, it's just a theory, y'all. That, oh, that's the, all I like. On a on. joke on the Mexican, like, uh, not the Mexican, the Mayan law, right? And and it's it's to your point, like how like the history got remixed through the ages, right? Mm -hmm. Their tale is that the flood happened, not so much to God to punish humans, but as to make up for a mistake made by the gods themselves in the creative process, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, just when me. you think about like the true biblical version of the God having to cleanse the world again because of what the, what was all the sin that was happening, you're like you can almost kind of see how. I can kind of see how y'all get to this conclusion. Yeah. But again, you can kind of see how it was a remake from the original flood story, right? But it's but but like to Kazi point, like you have all these different ancient cultures scattered around the world that all have some lore or myth or something about an ancient flood that happened back way back when to their people. Mm -hmm. And if you do believe the Bible that Noah and his three sons and their wives survived. We all could say we come from Adam, but really and truly, y'all could say we all come from Noah. Right. Fine. That was a very traumatic experience for them, for them people. So they all knew, like, yo, first of all, why are uh, why is it only us? Hmm. And they all say, hey, this is what happened. Like, right. nah, and that's the thing, bro. Like, wait, my wife and I could be telling the same story. You, you, you've been there. Some of them would be like, so tell us how y'all met, right? She hitting her high points, but my high points are completely different. You see what I'm saying? Like the details that I come up with are different than the details that she come up with. The details that mm -hmm. I leave out, different than the details that she leave out. And it's not even intentional. That's just how we process. That's just how we process it. So we have we have eight people who survived the flood. You see what I'm saying? All of them got a different story. Bro. You see what I'm saying? Like I mean, we could all agree that it was a flood. So I say all that to say, I was um, studying on this thing called the, um, oh, I can't remember. Oh, man, I really can't remember what it's called. But it's a theory of who wrote the Torah, right? Mm -hmm. And they have they have it like where it's like J wrote the Torah, wrote something. And then you have the P, which which represents the priest, J-E-P-D. If you put if you put in the J-E-P-D J -E -P -D theory, it's an it's, I think it's called a documentary theory on the, the Bible. J-E-P-D theory. Mm hmm theory that takes the explainable differences in the Pentateuch and and in in in, in, in and the and the and, uh, okay I see what you're saying okay, cool right so basically they they basically saying the Bible's the um the the first four the the Pentateuch the um Genesis the Deuteronomy was written by four different authors right and they categorized them by J and J are the people who say Yahweh right and then the they have this I don't know what E means. The Elohist. Yeah, people who say Elohim, right? Then you have P, which represents the priest. The and priest. then D, D represents Deuteronomy. Yeah. Like they, they think Deuteronomy just had a whole new writer, just period. And then they are they have a mystery character there too, who just come and summarize things. So anything that anything that can't be explained through JEPD, they say, oh, the mystery revisor, the, the, the mystery revisor. Um, just came and, and revised, I don't know, edited everything. So that's that. any inconsistency, they just blame it on him. So when I first came across this theory, that it kind of it kind of spooked me out a little bit because I was listening to a historian who's also a Jew who of this mindset. And this dude, he's good, bro. He can show you when the house of David, any archaeology, any archaeologist findings of the house of David, people in the Old Testament that actually exist to be of evidence to support all of these things. But when he get when he get earlier, like when he get to David and and earlier, obviously it wasn't too much document documentation on it because that's just not how society did things back then. And then in the Jewish faith, 
you know, they don't, they don't take pictures and, and they don't like do sculptures like how the Romans and, you know, the Babylonians that they, they were completely different. I think that kind of stems from um, the Ten Commandments, you know, don't make no graven images or anything on the heavens, on the earth. So you don't really have a statue of, oh, this is the statue of Solomon or this is the statue of King David. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> Who was trying to make a statue of himself? A Gideon A. Gideon, yeah. Gideon, I, I think Gideon was trying to make a, st a statue. He said Gideon, Gideon was booking. But anyway, right? So I say all I have to say, when I was first introduced to this thing, it, it, it was kind of scary to me because I'm like, people saying that the deep, even the deepest research that we have concludes that this, these writings were dated thousands of years after they claimed to be written. And they were written by people who who they were not written by the people they claim to be. So to me, that sounds like a lie. That sounds like the Bible lying. If Moses speaking in the first person in the book of Deuteronomy, but you're telling me someone outside of Moses doing this, I'm like, hmm, I, I want to be, I want to be, I want to be diligent in my studies, right? And so like that kind of bothered me, bro. That, that was bothering me for a time because I was trying my best to like, how do I disprove this? And when you Google it, the majority of people just ganging up on the Bible saying, oh yeah, the Bible is written by other people, J-E-P-D, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. I find, I try my best to find JEPD debunked and I find this one documentary and this dude was like, he was explaining to me how they landed on JEPD. And at the core of it, I realized it was, to me, it's dumb, bro. Like, it's really a theory, but people is pushed out like, this is not a theory, bro. Like, they pushing this on you like, oh, no, no, the Bible is written by other people. That's facts. And they do have compelling arguments, but let me tell you why it's a theory. J represents the people who say Jehovah, right? So they basically saying, knowing Earl and knowing the type of people during that time, Earl would call God, God. So if Earl turned around and saying Yahuwah, that had to be someone else writing. Earl would even say God one day and then say Yahusha. You see what I'm saying? Or Yahuwah. And then a third day, he say, Adonai. <laughs> what? Who this boy is? Like, this have to be another writer and this other writer linguistically, he used the term Adonai to describe him. You see what I'm saying? And so like, that's where they say, so like every time they see Jehovah, they're like, all right, that's a different author. This is a different author. This is a different author. And then they would say, uh, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, right? Mm -hmm. They call him Jethro one time and another time they call him Midian. Mm -hmm. They're like, but this have to be two different people. You see what I'm saying? And so I look at this and I like, is that, is that a, is that a foolproof way? of identifying authors, like, and I get y'all scholars and y'all probably smarter than me, but I like, wait, I could see a world where you could say in the cars and then you could say, hey, yeah, so I was talking to the cars the other day, blah, 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 as, and as you, and you still in the same conversation and you say, yeah, Kazi, you need to stop doing this. And do people say, do people have the right to say, no, but this have to be two different authors, two different school of thought because you use two, two different names. No, I, I might be saying the cars to people who, if if I if I intend to speak to people who don't know me, who don't know this person, but when I say Kazi, I think it's someone more intimate. You you know this person, you probably grow up with him, you're very familiar with him. I, I I make music. If you ask someone if they hear Kazi song, the average person don't know who you're talking about. But if you say Nakaz, they probably know. You see what I'm saying? Anyway, the person who debunked it, he was showing evidences in Pharaoh in ancient Pharaoh stilis where. They might be talking about a bottle that is documented in history. And in the stele, they might have two steles stamped by the same pharaoh and the two steles saying two different stories happen. So this one saying, oh yeah, we conquer because we do this. And the next one saying, oh no, we conquer because we do this. But it's stamped by the, by, like it's signed by the same pharaoh. You see what I'm saying? And, it might, and they also show evidence where it's like this one, and when I say steely, y'all, for y'all who don't know, it's a piece of a rock, right? It's a rock and they inscribe in the rock. Right? So you got to be precise with this, right? So in this rock, they might, they might have, they might call Pharaoh this one. No, Horus. They call Horus this one name. Horus is an Egyptian god. And then they call him another name in the same, in the same stele. And these people breaking it down, they're like, bro, this is not compelling evidence to say that the Bible was written by different authors. You know what I mean? And then they turn around and say, it, was, it had to be written in a different time frame because of the language used, right? And to me, I like, oh, that's also compelling. But guess what? They also show like, if it was written in a different time frame, we didn't have Google. They didn't have Google. They didn't have an encyclopedia. But some things they get spot on, which only could have happened 
if you was living during that time. Why Moses? I mean, why Abraham say Pharaoh was his sister? I mean, say Sarah was his sister. Because during that time, people used to do that. You see what I'm saying? We don't really see that outside. We don't really see that outside of Genesis. You mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? That was something common during that time. When you do the when you do the research of that time frame, you were more honorable as a sister. That's that's what that's what the, the dude in the document was was the documentary was saying. And so I'm like, bro, all of these like you can theorize anything, bro. I just had someone in the gym telling me that I am not black, I'm not of African descent, I'm of Indian descent. And when he said Indian, he was not talking about Native American. He's trying to say that people of our complexion, our um, features, we are native to this land. And we are called Indians. And the people from the from the East who are called who we know as Indians, they not real Indians. They from they they from they 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 their place was called Parat. It was in India, right? And I like, bro, that tripped me out because I like, man, I I've I've come across um Hebrew Israelites, I've come across Rastafarians, I've come across the nation of Islam, you know what I mean? And I talking about only people that like black, like black, like black people who have religious sex, right? And I have never, I have never come across this, you know? And so I was, I, I was dumbfounded because I'm like, bro, I have so many things to, to like, to argue your point. But when I try to, he turned around and said, that's what they want you to think. And I'm like, well, they succeeded, bro. <laughs> Whoever they is, they <laughs> succeeded, bro. You see what I said? Yeah. But I, I say all that to say this. It's a lot of theories out there. It's a lot of theories. But be mindful of people who pushing things on you. As if it's fact, you know what I mean. We in the book of we in the book of Nehemiah. I I believe Nehemiah wrote this book. I believe how the way he talking. This was written during that time. People could try to tell you, oh no, this was written after. People want to tell you the book of Daniel was not written by Daniel, and it was written after the fact. So the the prophecies that come about, or the head of gold with Nehemiah, the you, not Nehemiah with Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, and then the silver, all these things. They want you to believe that this was documented after the Persian Empire had, had already come. So it's easy to say, all right, the Babylonians going to reign, then the Medes and the Persians. No, they want you to believe it was written during the Greek period. I'm sorry. Like three, three kingdoms in, they want you to believe that. And that takes away from the power of the Bible. That takes away from saying this was prophesied. You know, when you, by, when you, me personally, when I, when I see prophecy in the Bible, this strengthens my faith because I believe that if you are a God, you know the beginning from the end. So you could tell me, when Adam and Eve fall, that a descendant from the seed of the woman will mm -hmm. crush the head of the devil. Well, why you wouldn't say the man? Because Jesus ain't had no earthly father. So when the Messiah come, he would come from the woman, which was Mary. Prophecy fulfilled. This is Genesis verse, this is Genesis chapter three, three verse 15 This happening. So when, when I see prophecy in the Bible, I'm like, bro, you can't tell me this false, bro. You cannot tell me this false. Show me where the devil is dread, bro. He could prophesy something 5,000, 6,000 years in advance. And show me that. Show me that in other cultures. No, all people can show you is a carbon copy of what God had already said. And then they try to say, oh, this is dated earlier in X, Y, Z. So I know we, oh, I get on this tangent, but I just felt that if anybody going to go down the rabbit hole that I go on, down, let me save you some time and let you know where I land with that. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> all right. So now to get to Nehemiah. So the last chapter we talked about Nehemiah 10. We just talked about tithing. We had a big old conversation about tithing at the end. But just to set the scene up for everyone who, I mean, has been following us, but anyone just jumping in in this episode. So Nehemiah was sent by God permission from the Persian king to come down to Jerusalem and help rebuild the walls. Um, he was a butler for the king. And by the grace of God, he was able to complete the wall, the whole city, the entire city walls with the help of the whole city. And all the Israelite people, but they were they were able to accomplish it in fifty two days. And then, so after the wall was completed, they had like a little dedication ceremony, and they had like a a, a, a a revival of sorts. They were able to confess their sins, and then now they were able to you know renew a covenant with God. And, and that was and that was in the last two uh, episodes. Went through uh, Nehemiah nine and ten, where we saw them going through a prayer dedication, and then we also see them signing signing, and uh, accepting the blessings and the curses of the covenant that was made to Abraham and that, and, and given them in Deuteronomy and, you know, reaffirmed to them throughout the ages. And we see these people saying, okay, we will renew this covenant with God and we will accept both the blessings and the curses. And we see one thing that we didn't really harp on last, last, last week's episode 
but again, like all the able people were able to understand. We see, and, and I like when they said the people were able to understand because some people like to get, I don't know, I won't say like to get, but some people, you know, baptize babies. I don't like these babies don't even know what they accepted. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But we see in the Bible saying you know, people were able to understand who are of age, were able to accept this covenant. You know what I'm saying? Because like, they were able, you know, you know what you're signing up for. You know what I'm saying? Like, you five, you don't really know what you're doing. Not even five, bro. When you say babies, some of that mean five months. I know. I know, but I just say, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you got, like, people who was able to comprehend what they signed up on, agreeing the, and agreeing, and, 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 you know, signing the dotted line, quote unquote. But, who was able to actually enter in this covenant when people actually were able to understand the word of God, understand what they were getting into, understanding what they should and should not do, having some level of comprehension that's suitable. Yeah, and, and another thing on that, right? I never actually gave this deep thought ever. I just know in that Venice church, they don't do it. But think about it, right? The Bible say, you know, you can't see the kingdom unless you're born again, right? And so I could see someone being zealous saying, but we just can make sure everybody, but everybody who any baby, anybody just get born again. Like, but consider what being born again is. This baby barely even born. You see what I'm saying? Like, you they only been around for a short period of time. You know what I mean? It kind of defeats the purpose of being born again if you never experience it or you never have a latch on, you never latch on to sin and want to leave that behind. You know what I'm saying? And then on top of that, the, the consent version of it. Like I was watching a show about, you know, it was kind of like tension between Vikings and and um, Christians. And during during that era, they were a baby born, but they baptized in that baby type situation. You know what I mean? But people of the the North, the Norse faith, you know, the Vikings and stuff, they was fundamentally against that. Like, so if you have an intermarriage there, the Christian party want to have their child baptized. But the Viking, like, bro, don't baptize my child, bro. You see what I'm saying? Type situation. Cause they don't, cause they they have two different ideas of heaven and X, Y, Z, but mm -hmm. the baby don't get the the baby in this ain't choosing what faith he a part of, like at all. You know what I mean? So yeah, I, I definitely get that. Okay. Okay, so we are in Nehemiah 11. This is gonna be a fun one. All right. Fun, <laughs> quote unquote. You know, but let's but see. I could, I could, but we could, we could, we could ping pong on some of these names. So, like, I, I feel like you was be, you was be doing some heavy lifting. <laughs> Getting abused, <laughs> beating up in the streets. Right. So it's it's thirty six chapters. You could, you could hit eighteen, and then I could hit the next eighteen because it's it's pretty consistent. Oh, perfect. All right. <laughs> now the leaders of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people cast lots to bring out. To bring one out of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine tents were to dwell in other cities. And the people were blessed, all men who willingly offered themselves to dwell in Jerusalem. So now we see after the wall was done, we had three sets of people. The leaders were in Jerusalem. Then you had a group of people who voluntarily said, okay, we will live in the city. And then we had another group of people who were coerced. They were chosen. God essentially said, you have to live in the city now. Mm. So, there, so these were three groups of people. And we see the people who were, who willingly offered, they said, God said, y'all, y'all will be, y'all, y'all definitely will be blessed. Um, we could get into the whole cast a lot's conversation if we so desire, but we, we talked about this before. Yeah, I, I cool on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now verse three, the, these are the heads of the providence who dwelt in Jerusalem. But in the cities of Judah, everyone dwelt in his own possession. In their cities, Israelites, priests, Nethanim, and descendants of Solomon's servants. Also in Jerusalem dwelt some of the children of Judah and of the children of Benjamin, the left-handed people. The children of Judah, Athiah, the son of Uzzah, Uzziah, the son of Zachariah, the son of Amariah, the son of Shephaniah, the son of Mahal Mahaleel, the son of children of Perez, and Messiah, the son of Baruch, the son of Kol Hosea, the son of Haziah, the son of Adiah, the son of Joy Arib, the son of Zachariah, the son of Shalonai. All the sons of Perez who dwelt in Jerusalem were 468 valiant men. 
and of the sons of Benjamin, Shalu, the son of Mash Mashulam, the son of Joed, the son of Padiah, the son of Koliah, the son of Masiah, the son of Ithiel, the son of Jes Jeshahiah, and after him, Gabai and Salai, 928. Joel, the son of Zikri, was, an, was their overseer, and Judah, the son of Shenuai, was the second over the city. So we're getting a little bit of breakdown on the people who are actually making sure the city functions. Yeah, the government of the city. Yeah, so now in verse 10 of the priests, Jehadiah, the son of Jo, Joyarib, and Jachin, Jashin, Zehariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Meshu, Meshulam. Meshulam, I don't know if it's the same Meshulam. But it's, it's, he got around. a lot of churn. Yeah, he's been around. <laughs> he got a lot of churn. The son of Zadok, the son of Mer, Merioth, the son of Athiab, was the leader of the house of God. Their brethren who did the work of the house were 822. And Ayadiah, the son of Jehoram, Je Jehoram, and the son of Piliah, the son of Amzi, the son of Zechariah, the son of Pashur, the son of Malkijah, and, and his brethren's heads of the father's houses were 242. 242. And Abishai, go for it. 242. Oh, yeah, 242. Crazy. <laughs> and Amashai, the son of Azarel, the son of Asai, the son of Meshilameth, the son of okay. Immer, and their brethren, mighty men of valor, were 128. Their overseer was Zabdiel, the son of one of the great men. Okay. Also the Levites, Shemai, the son of Hashib, the son of Azrakam, the son of Hashbaiah, the son of Bunai, Shebathai, and ja Josabad, of the heads of the Levites, had their oversight of the business outside of the house of the God. Mataniah, the son of Makat, Micah, Makah, interesting, the son of Zabdi, the son of Ashpa, the leader who began the thanksgiving with prayer. Bakbu Bakbukaya. The second among his brethren. I don't even seem like that's the same type of name. That, bro, I'm, I'm like, it's like a, a different language. Yeah, bro. I'm like, what? I, I, I'm, I'm like, well, you read number C, what that means. Bakbukaya. And I'll finish it. The, se the second among his brethren. And Abda, the son of Shamua, the son of Galal, the son of Jeruthan, and the Levites in the holy city were 284. Moreover, the gatekeepers, Akub, Talmud, and their brethren, who kept the gates, were 172. And the rest of, of Israel, of the priests and the Levites, were in all the cities of Judah, uh, everyone in his inheritance. But the Nathanim dwelt in Ophel, and Ziha, and Gishpa were over the Nathanim. Also the overseer of the Levites at Jerusalem was Uzai, the son of Banai, the son of Hashabiah, the son of Mataniah, the son of Micah, of the sons of Asa, the singers in charge of the service of the house of God. For it was the king's command concerning them that a certain portion should be for the, for the singers a quota day by day. And for those um, wondering, this was probably during the time of Solomon uh, and or the time of David, um, because that's what we start to see, this Aesop fellow. Uh, when we get to Psalms, we can kind of see um, some of the Psalms written by Aesop or of House Aesop, you know, where they just had a bunch of singers and, um, you know, poets and musicians. David himself was a, mu just, was a musician, so, you know. I believe that was the precedent that was set. And even, even unto this day, they still had Levites that were in charge of singing. You know, they said the sons of Aesop, the singers in charge of the service of the house of God, you know. All right. For it's the king's command concerning them that a portion, that a certain portion should be for the singers a quarter day by day. Pethahiah, the son of Meshezabel, of the children of Zerah, the son of Judah, 
was the king's deputy in all matters concerning the people. And as for the villages with the as for the villages with their fields, some of the children of Judah dwelt in Kirjath Arba and his vill- and his villages, Debon and his vill- and his villages, Jacob Zeal and his vill- and his villages, in Jeshua, Molad Molada, Beth Pelet, Azar, Shual, and Beersheba and its villages, in Ziklag and Mekona and its villages, in En Ramon, Zora, Jarmuth, Zanoah, Adulam, and their and their villages, in Lachish and its fields, in Azika and its villages, they dwelt from Beersheba to the valley, Hinnon. Also, the children of Benjamin from Geba dwelt in Michmash, Aja, and Bethel, and their vill- and their villages. In Anathoth, Nob, Ananiah, Ananiah, yep, in ha- and Hazor, Rama, Gitaim, in Hadid, Zeboim, Nebalat, in Lord, Ono, and the Valley of Craftsmen. Some of the Judean vision, some of the Judean divisions of Levites were in Benjamin. You have a you have a definition of yeah. It means, it means the Lord has emptied out. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, and like for those who know, this is the only man in the Bible whose name is Bakbukaya. Yeah, Bakbukaya. I call him Big Basha. Huh? I know it. <laughs> Bakbukaya. Uh, all right. Apparently, the book is uh, emptied because I realized also in Habakkuk, mm. or is like the Bak, either one of them. It's it also is like the emptied in in Habakkuk. It's interesting. All right, we got we got forty seven verses. The next one, I could hit twenty four. Go for it. You could, you could take us home at the twenty three. Brothers and sisters, stick with us. We have a lot of just names, you know, <laughs> they, they, telling us with the delegations and stuff like that. It's not very narrative based. That's where Earl and I thrive on. You know, I think we set the precedent a little early, just breaking down these names. His death shall bring, and you know what I mean. Like should be hitting the genealogy in Genesis. But yeah, so just a lot of names. Just, just so I mean, it, it for for the people that are kind of like are really fascinated with like the organization during this time. You know, this is very helpful because you, if you, if you was to set this up as like a like like a family tree, like a branch system, you could see all right here with the 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 sons of Asaph. Over them was this one, and then the Nathanim and and their leaders and and delegation and stuff. So I do think this is useful information, but. You know, it could kind of get mundane because it's just a lot at you at once. All right, so more at you at once. Um, chapter 12, verse 1. <laughs> now these are the priests and the Levites who came up with Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, Sariah, Jeremiah, Ezra, Amariah, Maluk, Hattush, Shechaniah, Reham, Remeth, uh, Merimoth, Edu, Jene. Jinnay Toai, I know I'm pronouncing that right. That's not like I just like, feel like that every Asian, week. A little bit. <laughs> Ab- 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 Abijah, Majamin, <laughs> Me- <laughs> feel like Bob Molly with that one. <laughs> All right, Bilga, Shemaya, Shoyaya Rib, Jedaya, Salu, Amok, Hilkaya, and Jedaya. These were the heads of the priests and their brethren in the days of Jeshua. Moreover, the Levites were Jeshua, Benuai, Kadmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, and Mataniah. I got one thing to say, just a little tangent, bro. Mm-hmm. It, it, bro, you remember when we was talking about um, Nehemiah going into the temple because that guy mm-hmm. was trying to entice him to go into the temple, right? And you were saying, yeah, Nehemiah, Nehemiah is not a Levite. Bro, Daddy instead, like I in, in conversation, I was like, yeah, yeah, he was in a Levite, but I instantly forgot that, bro. I keep forgetting during this whole book, this pious leader was not a Levite, bro. You know what I mean? But he he was the leader, bro. Like he's the mm-hmm. governor and XYZ, but he was not of the Levite. Now, historically, the Levites didn't lead, but they led in temple sacrifice and worship and stuff like that, you know. But that was that was, I think that was kind of fly, bro, like because. It, it go to show because I, I kind of writing a sermon on that a little bit because it go to show how zealous this person was, but it wasn't his job to be a minister. But it just goes to show 
how each one of us as Christian, it's our duty to be zealous for God, you know? It is. Also, side tangent, Mijamin, or Mihamin, apparently, is uh, means from the right hand. Oh. Which would be interesting because Benjamin was like... Left? Yeah. Well, they were I don't know if that means left. I don't know if that means left, but they were historically left-handed because I yeah. think Benjamin means something like my joy or something or, or something like, like he named it after his what I mean, Jacob named it kind of after. No, it was son of my right hand. Son of my right hand. Okay, never mind. You're right. Son of my right hand. He wanted to name him like something of my sorrow, right? And she was like, no. Yeah, she was like, no, I ain't doing that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I remember now. Son of my right hand. Okay. Jamin. That's it right there. Jamin, the suffix. Yeah. Ben Jamin. Yeah. Wow. Look ben, at this man in some Hebrew. I tell you. <laughs> That's interesting. All right. Moreover, verse 8. Moreover, the Levites were Jeshua, Benuai, Kadmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, and Mataniah, who led the Thanksgiving Psalms. He and his brethren, also Bakbukiah, the legend, and Unai, their brethren stood across from them in their duties. Jeshua begot Jehoiakim. Now we're getting into some, some lineage. Jehoiakim begot Eliashib. Eliashib begot Jehoiada. Jehoiada begot Jonathan. And Jonathan begot Jadua. In the days of Jehoiakim, the priests, the heads of the father's houses were, were of Sarah, Mariah, of Jeremiah, Hananiah of Ezra, Meshulam. Um, Meshulam is getting get, get, get mentioned a lot, boy. Right? Of Amariah, Jehohanan, Jehohanan, yeah, Jehohanan, whatever. Melaichu, <laughs> Jonathan of Shebaniah, Joseph of Harim, Adna of Marioth, Marioth, I don't know, Helkai of Edu. Wait, where I said I was going to stop? 20, 24, all right. Yeah. You, Zechariah of Genosa. <laughs> I said, man, this going on in long now. Anyway. <laughs> oh, Abijah of oh, oh, Zikri, the son of Minjamin of Mo, Moadiah, Hiltai of Bilga, Shamua of Shemaiah, Jeho- Jehoanathan of Jehoarib, Joiarib, Metaniah of Jediah, Uzai of Salai, Kalai of Amok, Eber of Hilkiah, Hashabiah of Jediah, Nathanel, oh, and of, and of, Jedid, and of Jedidiah, Nathanel. During the reign of Darius the Persian, a racket was kept of the Levites and priests who had been heads of their father's houses in the days of Eliashib, Jehoiada, Jehoana, Je- Jehoanan and Jadua, the sons of, of Levi, the heads of the father's houses until the days of Jehoanan, the son of Eliashib, were written in the book of the Chronicles. I, and the head, I got head, it. Head? Okay. And the heads of the Levites were Hashba, Hashabiah, Sherebiah, which apparently means... um. I just had it, but like the singing with the Lord. Yeah, that's a share by me, singing with the Lord. Mm-hmm. And Jeshua, the son of Kadmiel, with their brothers across from them, and to praise and give thanks groups, to praise and give thanks group, alternating with group according to the command of David, the man of God. Mataniah, Bakbuhiah, Obadiah, Mashulam, Tal- Talmon, and Akhud, Akub were gatekeepers keeping the watch at the storerooms of the gates. These lived in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Jeshua, the son of Jasoda, and in the days of Nehemiah, the governor, and Ezra, the priest, the scribe. All right, verse 27. Now at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out all the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving and singing with cymbals and string instruments and harps. It's funny because isn't the harp a stringed instrument? Suppose, like plot twist, like the harp back in the day is completely different than the harp. Something we have different. Today. Yeah. <laughs> I doubt it, but that would be funny though. You yeah, know, right? technically the harp back in the day used to be what we call the recorder. <laughs> the recorder. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
I'm like, oh. Huh. That's funny. Anyway, the sons and of the singers gathered together from the countryside around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Nethophathites, from the house of Gilgal, and from the fields of Geba and Arzmarveth. Arzmarveth. For the singers had built themselves villages around Jerusalem. Then the priests and the Levites purified themselves and purified the people, the gates, and the wall. So I brought the leaders of Judah up on the wall and appointed two large Thanksgiving choirs. One went to the right hand of, on the wall towards the refuse gate. After them went Hosea. Hosea. Well, it ain't really Hosea, but it's close. <laughs> and half of the leaders of Judah. And Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, Jeremiah, and some of the priests' sons with trumpets, Zachariah, the son of Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, Shemaiah, the son of Mataniah, the son of Mil 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 Milkiah, the son of Zakur, the son of As As Asaph, and his brethren, Shemariah, Azarel, Milai, Gilai, Maiai, uh, Methanel, Judah, and Hanani, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God. And Ezra the scribe went before them by the fountain gate in front of them. They went up the stairs of the city of David on the stairway of the wall beyond the house of David, as far as the water gate eastward. The other Thanksgiving choir went the opposite way. And I was behind them with half of the people on the wall going past the tower of the ovens, as far as the broad wall, and above the gate of Ephraim, above the old gate, above the fish gate, the tower of Hananel, the tower of a hundred, as far as the sheep gate, and they stopped by the gate of the prison. So the two thanksgiving choirs stood in the house of the God, likewise I and half of the rulers with me, and the priests, Elikim, Messiah, Minhamin, Milkiah, Elonai, Zachariah, and Hanani with trumpets, and also Messiah, Shemaiah, Eleazar, Uzai, Johanan, Milkaijah, Elam, Izer. The singers sang loudly with, with Jazariah, the director. Also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced, so the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. So we see here this whole uh for from 27 down to 43 was just um Nehemiah recounting essentially the praise walk that happened. We see a two choir set that went in opposite directions that were directions that met back at the house of God. But as they walked, they were praising, they were praising God and giving him thanks for the accomplishment that God allowed them to do. Like, remember, this happened in 52 days less than two months that God was able to turn the situation around. The city had no wall two months ago. Mm. No wall. But now they have a fortified city. They have, they have recommitted. They, they, they have read the word of Lord, the God allowed to them. They have recommitted to following God. They have re-signed up for the covenant with God. So much happened in a sh arguably a short amount of time. You know what I'm saying? It's like, their neighbors can't even recognize them no more. They barely can recognize themselves. They're keeping, they're keeping uh, festivals that haven't been kept in over a thousand years. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? David ain't keep it. All these other prophets ain't keep it. Like, this is just mind-blowing. And now we see that walking around, giving thanks to God, praises, the instruments are out. People are singing, giving, just praising God. Kind of what I was talking, talking about before, like praising God for the things he had done for them as a nation. And we see, like, they're rejoicing. They're having a good time in the Lord. They're praising, singing, music, music is playing. You know what I'm saying? Cymbals clashing. You know, they outside singing. And people outside the city walls can hear them singing and praising. You see, mm -hmm. this, could be, this could be heard from afar off. Think about it. Their enemies probably can hear them. Remember when mm -hmm. Moses was coming down the wall with uh, Joshua, and Joshua was like, oh, they're being attacked. <laughs> Moses was like, that's the no. song of rivalry I hear right now. Oh, that's debauchery <laughs> down there. <laughs> but you can imagine that being, that, you can you can, you can imagine that song traveling, this is actually praise to God. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like get a whole nation collectively giving thanks and praise to their God. 
That's, like, that's just fun. that's just incredible. Ah, <sighs> all right. So let's get a couple more verses to end this chapter. And at the same time, some were appointed over the rooms of the storehouse for offerings, the first fruits, and the tithes to gather into them from the fields of the cities, the portion specified by the law of the priests and of the Levites for Judah, rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who ministered. Excuse me. Both the singers and the gatekeepers kept the charge of their God and the charge of the purification according to the command of David and Solomon his son. For in the days of David and Asaph, of old were the chiefs of the singers, the songs of praise and thanksgivings to God. In the days of Zerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah, all Israel gave the portions for the singers and the gatekeepers, portions for each day. So they also consecrated the holy things for the Levites, and the Levites consecrated them for the children of Aaron. Man, let's um, let's, let's, let's end it off, bro. Just want to end it? Yeah, let, no, no, I'm saying let's end the book. You oh, okay? Okay. Let's end the book. We, no, let's let's save it for the next episode. That way we can just like recap on Nehemiah. Okay. One time. Okay. Okay. That's what's up. So I mean, we had we had a good much um, introduction. I can say introduction, but like kind of recap on the people that came. You know, they they went. They take us all the way back to Zerubbabel. You know what I mean? So it's kind of interesting because if I'm not mistaken, in Ezra they they walked us through everyone who left that mm -hmm. time. You know what I mean? And so now nah, this Nehemiah account of it. You know, so Nehemiah could talk about. It's funny because Nehemiah almost like a contractor, you know, like Ezra them day was building this city, you know, it's a good much years come by. Nehemiah like, all right, I, I'm here for a short, not I'm here for a short period of time, but I hit, I'm here, and in a short period of time, I gonna we 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 gonna work on this project. Now that the project is done, you know, let's get right, let's get right, you know what I mean? So, and I, I glad they had people like Ezra, Nehemiah, you know, it's some things that wasn't ideal. Like the way they handle. Um, ah, anyway, we 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 can recap next next episode. But mm -hmm. you know, it was it was some pros and cons to the leadership in these two books. But overall, you could see the fruits of their labor, like literally and figuratively. Like you could see they have a fortified city, right? But then also you could see that you know it was people in place working hard to make sure that the morale of their religion had been restored. And so now. We could not only have we repented, you know, we we celebrate, we praise and worship, but we we have an established system of religious leaders in place, you know. So a lot of times, so a lot of us, we most of this, most of these two, most of these chapters, we went through the priests and the Levites, you know what I'm saying? You know, we have the singers, this the people of Aesop, we have the Nathanaim, you you understand what I'm saying? We just have people just dedicated as priests. And I don't think we they, 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 they mentioned Nehemiah because obviously he wasn't a priest, you know what I'm saying? But he is fundamental in, you know, the entire organization. Mm -hmm. And it just goes to show, bro, like, you know, all things done in, in decency and in order. You see what I'm saying? We serve a God. It's not a God of confusion. And so the way how our churches need to be set up, need to be organized, you know what I'm saying? And it's interesting because what I see is a lot of, um, people that are available, you see what I'm saying, that are committed to doing the work. I can't tell you the last time I had a, a role in church, maybe in, in college. That's when I was on the AY team. I served on the AY team for two years. But other than that, I like to, I, I really just like to be a part of the audience, bro. I like to sit and I like to enjoy the service. I don't like the responsibility. You know what I mean? Like my boy, my boy Sam, he he was the AY leader at at the church that we go to in, in um Popka. And he needed me to he needed me to participate in the service. And I really did not want to, bro. Like I, I really didn't want to. He he was asking me to to um to, to to do a poem. And I tell him, I said, bro, if if you if you really need it, like, you know what I'm saying, hit me up and ask. And he's like, Okay, I'm hitting you up and I'm asking. Like this is it all in the same conversation. He's like, Yeah, I'm hitting you up and I'm asking. Like, I really need it. Like, and I was like, Oh man. Okay, and I did it. It went well. It went well. But mm. sometimes I was a little like, you just feel pressure. Like, if I have to do anything in front of people, 
my whole day, I preoccupy. That's preoccupying my thoughts. Like, you know what I mean? I can't rest. I can't just have a normal day and then go and do something. But then a day, you got to be willing and able to work for the Lord, bro. Like, Amen. A, lot of, a lot of times our church is locked in the youth department because the young people, the young people who are funny and, and fresh and, you know, vibey, they even want to go to church or they even want to have that structure. You know what I mean? And that's not helping. I, I tell myself a while ago, bro, like, if you if you complain about something and you know how it should be better, go make it do better. It. Yeah, make it better, bro. If you could tell me, oh, bro, you the way you the way you um the way you building this the way you building this wall, you are using the wrong material. You need a better wood. You need to cut this better or whatever. Instead of just complaining, why well, don't say let me help you? Let me help you cut this solid because like when a, a storm come a wind blow too hard, this could this could break apart. You see what I'm saying? But a lot of times we just we just complain and we don't offer. We don't commit. If you if you every week you saying, bro, this could be better, this could be better, and you have it in your ability to to make it better, go in, go in, go in support. I'm sure any church would be happy to have extra hands on deck because I've been in conversations with you know, people it's like people in like the leadership and the the functionality of the church. And you know, a lot of times they don't really have able participants and the people that are able. A lot of times they might they might have flaws. You know, some people might be stuck in their ways. Some people might be disorganized. Some people, God, I mean, hate to say, some people might just be lazy. You know what I'm saying? Like they don't they 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 want to they want the role. You see what I'm saying? But they don't they don't have the work ethic to to do it with with, with justice. You know? But here we see where, in in terms of the Israelites, they're in a reconstruction phase. They're a developing country at this point, and um, they have people. They have people in place, they are organized, they delegated, and this is going to be, a, you know, a cornerstone for them to continue to build their nation into the godly nation that they were supposed to be in this covenant. In this covenant. In this covenant. The rulers of the city all lived in Jerusalem, but the inhabitants casted lots to decide who would live in Jerusalem and who would live on the outer plains. In these two chapters, we learn about the company of people that return to Jerusalem, their lineage, as well as their tasks and titles. Israel has now restored their walls, their city, as well as their religion. But let's see how long that lasts. But we'll talk more about that on the next episode of A Breath of, of, a fresh, breath air. of fresh Air. Thank you for tuning in this week. Remember to go ahead and research on your own in order to get a more firm understanding of tonight's episode. And if you enjoyed it, make sure to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. You can follow us on social media at A Breath of Fresh Air Pod on Instagram and B O F A P O D on Twitter. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next week.